following is a production of the Media Ministry at New Salem Baptist Church in Saudi Daisy, Tennessee, in the metro Chattanooga area. We invite you to be our guest at any of our weekly worship services or visit us online at NewSalemBaptist.net. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. Welcome to Worship Day at New Salem. We are so glad that you are joining us, whether you're here in the building or whether you're joining us online. Uh, we're excited to come together on this beautiful day to, to celebrate Jesus and what he's done in our lives. And we have a, a special uh, observance going on today. We are going to be, in a few minutes, we're going to be paying tribute to our mothers. We've got some, uh, some things going on with some parents today that we're very excited about. And more on that in just a moment. But if uh, we just want to say welcome, and for some of you, it's welcome back. Every week, a few more people join us. We keep uh, expanding and getting, trying to get back up to speed, and uh, we're excited that you're here today to be part of worship. We especially like to welcome you today if this is your first time with us, whether you're new in the building or whether you're joining us online for the first time, and we'd love the chance to get to know you a little bit. One of the ways we do that, if you're here in the building, you'll notice on the back of the pew, there's a little blue and white card. It says, let's make a connection. If you wouldn't mind taking that and filling it out and putting your, the way you prefer to be contacted on there. And then after the service, as you exit the, the back of the building, you'll notice there's a little white box there. You can just drop that in the slot and we'll be in touch very, very soon. If you're joining us online, you can go to our website at newsalembaptist.net. Scroll down the homepage. There's a form there that you can use for that same purpose. Just fill it out, hit submit, and then we'll be in touch. But thank you so much for being with us today as we worship together. I was at Walmart last night, and I noticed something very interesting that tells me a little bit about the signs of the times. All of their face masks were on discount, 
on Clearex. Uh, <laughs> Uh, listen, we, our, our mantra over the last couple of months has been we're going to reopen as quickly as possible, but as slowly as necessary. We are keeping a very close eye on both the infection rates and the vaccination rates in our area. Both of those have been headed in the right direction for some time now. So we're slowly beginning to phase out some of the precautions that we've been observing that have allowed us to meet safely for the last year. And uh, ever since last May 31st, as a matter of fact, it's the first time we had an in-person service coming out of the lockdown. But uh, we're, you may have noticed last week we stopped taking temperature checks. This week you'll notice that the ropes are gone. All right. The, yeah. <laughs> we are going to ask for you to continue to help us uh, over the next few weeks as we continue to just kind of step out onto that ice. Uh, again, it's really, really common sense stuff. If you're sick, please stay home. You can join us on the live stream. We're glad we're able to make that available, and we'll, we'll see you when you're feeling better. The other thing is, is even though we've removed the, the, uh, the ropes and we've kind of opened up some space, if you'll just kind of respect each other's space uh, to, to help each other feel comfortable, we'd appreciate that. And if, you, if it helps you to feel comfortable to wear a face covering uh, when you're here in, in a group, then you are welcome to do that. We've never required it. We've encouraged it. But we've kind of left that up to each individual in respect of their choice on that. Uh, I know for me, uh, I just got my second shot Friday. So I'm, probably for the next couple of weeks, I'm going to continue to wear my face mask when I'm mingling with people just to be safe. And then we'll see what happens after a couple of weeks when that shot's had time to, to take effect. But like I said, we're just kind of feeling our way out here. And we appreciate your cooperation as we continue to open things up. We've got new, our, our Sunday school groups, uh, new ones are, are starting back just about every week. Our goal is by the end of the month to have everything, those, all those pretty much back. And then over the summer, we'll begin to restart some of our other ministries. So it's an exciting time to, to be a part of New Salem, and we're glad you're here to be part of that. Um, we're going to now move into a time of prayer, and one of our deacons is going to come, or the Mike Mayfield is going to come. He's going to share some things that people have asked us to pray for, and he's going to lead us in prayer. And a couple of things as we pray that I want to mention specifically, we've had several families in our church that have lost loved ones recently. We especially want to lift them up. And also, I, I realize as excited as many of us are that today is Mother's Day, uh, this is not the happiest day for everybody. Uh, for some people, this is a day that brings some painful associations with it. And so we especially want to be sensitive to those of you who that may be the case for. And we want to pray especially for you as well. Uh, Brother Mike, would you come and lead us? As we go in the season of prayer, let's uh, pray for the ones that the Lord lays on our hearts. I always pray for our loss and our nation. Pray for continued healing from this coronavirus. Continue to pray for our people who are out of work, our sick and shut-ins. Pray for all the mothers today and pray for all the people that uh, can celebrate with their mothers and also pray for the people that have lost their, their mothers and uh, just pray that you'll comfort them. Um, pray for the ones that's lost loved ones in the past few weeks and months. Uh, Anita Chadwick passed away this week. Continue to pray for Johnny and their family. Lois Skinner, Bonnie Clift, Charlie Rogers, Margaret Spangler, Jerry Holloway, Judy McDaniel, Robin Hale, Barbara Lee, Kay Upton, Pete and Connie Nix, Joyce Holcomb, Jamie Gann, Jack and Joyce Johnson, Freddie and Judy Weiss, Laura Mels Never, William Loftus, James and Tina Newman, Ken and Lois Johnson, remember Lois, especially because she she had a little fall yesterday. Continue to pray for her uh, and her healing. Tom and Sandy Hughes, Wayne and Polly Hatmaker, Tommy Smith, Martha Hudson, Dot Evans, Elizabeth Mayfield, Sandra Jordan, Dot Uren, Joe Vandergriff, Tommy Mangrum, Stephanie Allison Jones, Jerry Teague, uh, pray for Linda Atwood and her father, uh, Mr. Johnson, passed away. They're having his funeral today at 2 o'clock at Williamson's. Pray for Deborah Rohr, June Allison, Judy Jordan, 
Bob and Judy Miller, Faye Porter, Richie Shelton, Joe Kraft, Nancy uh, Uran, Shirley Cox, Terry Buckner, Mackenzie Yick, Brenda Robertson, uh, Shirley Sawyer, Tim Burroughs. Um, continue to pray for our fire and our police and our first responders and our school teachers, our servicemen and women, our health care workers, our president and our leaders. <clears throat> pray for our Sunday schools. It started back, if, you, if, you, uh, if you're looking for a Sunday school group, uh, we started back and uh, so you can come and we can, we can hook you up with uh, a class that most fits your need. Pray for our pastor and our worship team and all that has a part in our service today. Pray for our children, our youth ministries, and our leaders. We have any unspoken requests? Okay, all across the house. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that we can come and worship you today. We thank you, Lord, for Mother's Day, and we know, Lord, that uh, we have several that still have their mothers, and we have some who have passed on. We pray for those today that might be traveling to visit with mothers. We thank you, Lord, for our visitors, Lord, that, uh, that are mothers that came today. And we uh, pray, Lord, that you'll help us, Lord, as we go throughout today to honor each one of the mothers. We pray for our service today. We pray, Lord, that we'll uplift Jesus, that we'll praise his name, and all the glory will go to you. We pray that you'll be with us guide us and direct us in our lives and help us, Lord, to praise you and be a witness for you in each thing we do. In Christ's name, amen. All right, I'm going to ask for a little help from our ushers. If they would come forward with the, uh, the, the, their assignments. And, you know, uh, the church didn't invent Mother's Day, but we're behind the sentiments that's expressed. In fact, we've been honoring moms for a lot longer than there's been a day on the calendar. Uh, one of the primary ways we are called, one of the primary commandments we are called to ex use to express our love for God is to love our fathers and mothers. And so for 2,000 years, we have been doing that. Maybe not all the same way, but uh, we want to give honor to those to whom honor is due. And none of us would be here without our moms. Amen. Amen. Usually Mother's Day is, uh, I mean, of course, it's a little different this year, but usually Mother's Day is the third highest attended day of the year behind Christmas and Easter. Uh, ironically, one of the lowest attended days of the year typically is Father's Day. Guys, yeah, sorry. We're going to try to change that this year, but uh, we want to honor moms today. So uh, we have a special gift for our moms today. It's just a little token of our, of our appreciation, just a, a little something to say, we love you, we appreciate you. So here's what I'm going to do. If, if someone calls you mom, I'm going to ask you to remain seated while the rest of us stand in your honor. And then these men are going to pass through the aisles, and they've they got a little gift for, for all of the moms that are here today. Okay. If somehow we missed you, if you just give a little signal, one of these guys will get to you as soon as they can. All right. Have we gotten everybody? Oh, we got one down here. Hey, can I get one of the guys down here on the second row? We apologize for that. 
All right. Let's give a round of applause for all the moms today. We thank you and appreciate you. You may be seated, so thank you. One of the special things about Mother's Day here at New Salem is uh, every year we have an opportunity, usually on Mother's Day, to, uh, for some parents to do something very special. Now, we don't have to do it on Mother's Day. It just seems to work out very special to do it that way. In fact, we have one family that, that wasn't able to participate today because of a schedule conflict. We're going to schedule special time for them to take part in this. But we have some parents that w want to stand before you today and make a very special commitment to dedicate their children to the Lord, to commit themselves, to uh, teach their children to love and honor the Lord, and uh, for us as a church to make a commitment to these parents to pray for them, to encourage them, and to help hold them accountable as they help raise their kids. So I'm going to ask the families that are participating here, we got three of them, if you guys would join me up front here. And we'll see how this works with the microphone. Probably not very well, but... All right. First, we have Riverland Bell Thornton here. Six, she gets the prize for the newest today, six months old. She is the daughter of Dakota and Brooklyn Thornton, uh, the granddaughter of Keith and Tanya Friedel, and Kevin Thornton and Amy Arwood. So everybody say hello to Riverland. Okay, and we also have, we have a certificate we're going to hand each of you as just a way to remember this occasion and uh, put it in a place where you'll see it and that reminds you to pray for your kids and also you can, as they get older, you can tell them about this day. So let me give that to you. <laughs> and this is Ruby Leanne Clempen and she is a, a year and a half. And last year, we were still under lockdown on Mother's Day, so we weren't able to do this. So we have some kids have been waiting a while. But uh, this is Miss Ruby, and she is the daughter of Tom and Alicia Clempen, the granddaughter of Terry and Yvette Buckner, and Tom Sr. and Rita Clempen. So hey there. Hi. So everybody say hi to Ruby. And there's a certificate for you guys. And this is, this is Big Brother Hank. All right. Uh, Going to be starting forward next year. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, falling in dad's footsteps there we go um, and this is Carter Lafferty she is 21 months old and she is the daughter of Todd and Laura Lafferty and uh, Tommy the uh, granddaughter of Tommy and Regina Lafferty and Richard and Jenny Tenbarge and they are able to be here today uh, it came a long way to be here and uh, we are, are excited to have them be able to hear to be part of this as well in fact the very conversation Todd and I had uh, they had just moved to the area and he reached out to me they were looking for a place to take part in something like this and so we uh, this is how that journey started so it's good to have you guys with us all right okay the way this works it's kind of like a responsive reading yes sir well yeah let's say hi to these folks over here hello all right, the way this works is kind of like a responsive reading. I have a charge I'm going to give to the parents, and they have a response. And then I have a charge I'm going to give to us as a church. And uh, I'll, there's a place for you to respond as well. And then after that, I'm going to, I'm going to pray for these families. So let's, let's begin. To the parents, the child you hold is a gift from your Heavenly Father. Before the thought of a little baby entered your mind, the Lord had already planned and prepared for the child and determined for you to be its parents. Therefore, the birth of your child is an occasion to celebrate and reflect on God's goodness. How do you respond? We are blessed. Now, Scripture commands you as parents to teach your child about the Lord Jesus Christ. Only then will he or she be adequately equipped for the challenges of this life and sufficiently prepared to meet the Lord when he returns. But your child's spiritual welfare will not be accomplished simply by telling him or her about Jesus. It's the words of your mouth combined with the obvious presence of the Holy Spirit in your own life that will effectively communicate the message of God's love and saving power to your child. The birth of your child needs to inspire within you a greater resolve to let Christ shine through you 
by being even more intentional in your own pursuit of holiness and the supremacy of God in your home? What is your response? We are committed. Church, we're all part of the family of God. As a family, we need to work alongside these parents in their efforts to portray Christ to their children. Are we merely spectators? Or will we rise to the challenge of being brothers and sisters in Christ, exhibiting godly characteristics, and thus providing continuity in what is being taught at home and what is being taught at church? Church, if you're willing to take on the responsibility to support, pray for, and encourage these parents, please indicate this by saying, Amen. Amen. As a family, we must also be willing to hold one another accountable and to confront one another when a mistake is made in order that the purity and integrity of our commitments are maintained. You've heard these parents state their commitment to a greater level of Christ-likeness for the sake of their child. Will you now acknowledge their commitment and indicate your willingness to hold them accountable? If so, please acknowledge us by saying, Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we rise to bless your name today. We are so thankful that we can call you Father. You've created us. You created us in your image in order to have a relationship with you. And Lord, even when we became the prodigal and ran away and resisted you and tried to chart our own course in your grace and your mercy, you have lovingly pursued us. You left your door open and invited us in so we can be forgiven and cleansed and restored. Father, thank you for the gift of children. I pray for these moms and dads as they take on this responsibility to guide their children in life, to teach them, to inspire them. I pray for your grace to be on them. I pray that you will give them wisdom. I pray that you will give them uh, commitment. And I pray that you will draw them closer to yourself so that their children can see you at work in their lives. Father, lift up these families, encourage them, keep them close to yourself. Bless these children, keep them safe. Lord, call them to yourself. And Lord, may they come to love and honor you with all their hearts. As a church, help us to pray for these families, to encourage them, to come alongside them, and to be an extended family for them on this journey. Thank you for the bond we have in Jesus by our shared faith in him. And Lord, may that relationship spill over and bless each of these families. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give these families a hand. Thank you guys for taking on this commitment. Are you there? (laughs) All right, you guys can be seated.
Christ be magnified.
Sometimes it's hard for moms to get any respect. There was a fourth grade teacher who was trying to teach a lesson on magnetism. So she gave a little pop quiz. She asked the kids to give her a six-letter word, starts with M, that picks things up. Over half the class put M-O-T-H-E-R. There was a four-year-old and a six-year-old got together, got in their piggy banks and pulled their money together to buy their mom a a beautiful potted plant for Mother's Day. And because they spent their own money, of course, she was thrilled about it. But the the six-year-old had kind of a pouty look on her face as they were handing this over. And she said, Mom, there was another bouquet at the flower shop we really wanted to get you. But it was just too expensive. I mean, it was beautiful. It was so pretty. It had this pretty ribbon on it that would have fit you perfectly. Rest in peace. (laughs) Mom, you're always telling us about how you like a little peace so you can get some rest. You know, being a good mother is not easy. For that matter, neither is being a good father. Being a parent is at the same time one of the most rewarding and most challenging things you will ever take on. Thankfully, the Bible is full of advice and examples on how to be a good parent. It's also got some examples on what not to do. But one of the good examples is a godly lady named Hannah, whose story we find in the first couple of chapters of the book of 1 Samuel. Now, before we dive into that passage, a couple of disclosures in order. First of all, uh, 10 years ago, on Mother's Day 2011, I taught on this same passage. Now, at that time, we posted both the audio and the printed notes on our website. And wouldn't you know it, that message has gone on to become one of the most requested sermons we've ever posted. Two years ago, when we moved to our new website, we did not move a lot of that older material over. But even to this day, it is still one of the most searched for items on our new website. I I checked the last seven days, I think 34 people have tried to access that sermon. Apparently they bookmarked it the first time they found it and tried to go back to it. Uh, that tells me apparently it struck a chord with some people. So I've decided to revisit this passage this year for a fresh look. Besides, our church has changed an awful lot in the last 10 years. And so there's a good chance many of you never heard that original message. Second thing is uh, I need to give some credit where credit is due. The original idea for this message and the five main points on the outline uh, were inspired by a guy named Brian Bill, who's a pastor in Illinois. I found his sermon on this passage when I was doing my research on the passage originally and uh, just found it very helpful the way he organized. Now, I've kind of taken things in a a little little different direction than he did, but I still want to give a hat tip and say I appreciated his insights. It really helped me as I tried to work through this passage. So with that behind us, let's move on to Hannah's story and the things that we can learn from this godly lady to help us as we are trying to be godly parents. And one of the first things we can learn from Hannah is that godly parents wrestle with real problems. Starting in chapter 1, verse 1. Now there was a certain man from Ramathaim Zophim from the hill country of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, the name of the other was Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man would go from his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests to the Lord there. When the day came that Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all of her sons and daughters, But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival, however, would provoke her bitterly to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. It happened year after year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she would provoke her so that she wept and would not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not better to you than ten sons? You see, some people have this mistaken idea uh, that godly people never have any problems. Okay? Uh, No, that's not true. (laughs) Um, Hannah reminds us that 
not, that godly people do have problems. They are not exempt from trouble. The difference is how they handle their problems. They trust God with their problems. Now, Hannah faced a, a long list of challenges. First of all, Hannah lived uh, in a politically and socially unstable land. This is taking place during that chaotic period in Israel's history known as the period of the Judges. When, uh, according to Judges 17, 6, there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. So it was a very chaotic, lawless time. It was the Old West. Even the religious leadership was corrupt. In verse 3, the, the writer makes a point to mention these two sons of Eli, who was the head priest at that time, Hophni and Phinehas. And we get into chapter 2 and we find out these guys uh, were pretty ungodly, even though they were priests. They had a reputation for dishonesty and philandering. However, it was through Hannah, this godly woman, that God would set in motion the events that would eventually lead to the anointing of Israel's very first king. Hannah was also challenged, as we read, by being forced to share the attention of her husband. Hannah's husband, Elkanah, had two wives. Now, the Bible is clear from the very beginning that God's plan originally was for one man, one woman to be united together in a covenant of marriage for life. Uh, however, Hannah and her family lived in a culture where polygamy was both accepted and practiced. That doesn't mean that God approved of it, but that's, a lot of people saw no problem with that. They lived that way. Here's the interesting thing, though. In most cases where polygamy is portrayed in the Old Testament, uh, it is not a pleasant picture. These relationships are often characterized by strife and rivalry. And that's exactly what we see right here. While Elkanah loved Hannah, she and his other wife did not get along. They were competitors for his attention and his affection. And on top of all that, Hannah was challenged by infertility. Now, some of you are well aware of the special pain that goes along with that. Unfortunately for Hannah, she lived in a culture where a woman's value often was judged primarily for her ability to bear children. Hannah's rival, Penina, had given birth to several children. And she never passed up an opportunity to hold that fact over Hannah's head. So Hannah had a lot of problems. And Hannah's problems affected her deeply. She shed tears. She refused to eat. She had all the signs of what we would call depression. And these problems even affected her relationship with her husband, as we saw. Now, Hannah didn't wallow in her circumstances, but instead she took her circumstances to the Lord. Hannah's family made annual trips to the central sanctuary there in Shiloh to worship. And so during one of those trips, Hannah sought the Lord's help. And this is the second thing we can learn from Hannah's story. Not only do godly parents have problems, but godly parents pray powerful prayers. Picking up in verse 9. Then Hannah rose after eating and drinking in Shiloh. The, uh, part of the religious ceremony there, they would have a sacrifice, and then they would cook the meat from the sacrifice, and then they would actually have a, a meal together where they would share that. So Hannah rose after that meal. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord, and wept bitterly. She made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and a razor shall never come upon his head. And it came about as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli was watching her mouth. As for Hannah, she was speaking in her heart. Only her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. So Eli thought she was drunk. And Eli said to her, how long will you make yourself drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah replied, no, my Lord, I am a woman oppressed in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant as a worthless woman, for I have spoken until now out of my great concern and provocation. Then Eli answered and said, go in peace. 
And may the God of Israel grant your petition that you have asked of him. She said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. So Hannah poured out her concerns before God and entrusted him for the results. You've heard about leaving it at the altar. That's what she did. Hannah prayed so fervently that Eli thought she was drunk. And in that prayer, Hannah asked God to give her a son. And in return, she promised to dedicate that son to the Lord. Uh, now, this is interesting because normally, uh, the, uh, uh, well, she promised to turn him over to the priest to be raised there at the tabernacle. And typically, according to the law of Moses, only descendants of the tribe of Levi were allowed to work alongside the priest. Uh, and as we saw in verse 1, Elkanah apparently was counted as a member of the tribe of Ephraim. Now, that's led some scholars to think maybe Elkanah actually was a Levite. The Levites many times lived scattered out. Among, they didn't have land of their own. They lived scattered out among the tribes. So maybe he was a Levite. He just happened to be living in the territory of Ephraim. We don't know. In any case, all we do know for sure is that she made this commitment that if God would give her a son, she would turn him over to the priest to be raised. Hannah promised to also to bind her son with what's called a Nazarite vow. That's what it means that you know, the statement, the razor shall never come upon his head. Uh, the Nazarites were a very special group of people who were specially dedicated to the Lord by an oath. And we read about this in the book of Numbers, chapter 6. One of the signs of being a Nazarite, being under this special oath, was that uh, he or she was not allowed to cut her, their hair for as long as the oath was in effect. Now, typically, this Nazarite vow was only made for a specific duration of time, but Hannah's commitment was that her son would be a Nazarite from the time he was born on, specially dedicated to the Lord. Now, today, we may not turn our kids over to be raised at the temple, but there does come a point where all children have to entrust their kids into the Lord's hands. No matter how much you want to hover over them, you can't supervise them at all times for their entire life. Sooner or later, we have to trust them to do the right thing even when we're not looking. And at some point, all we can do is entrust them into God's hands. Sadly, sometimes our children will choose to rebel against what we've tried to teach them. Uh, at those times, it is even more important that we commit them into the Lord's care. Uh, there was once a woman named Monica who uh, had a very gifted and intelligent son. And after he finished his education, he left home to secure a prestigious position in the capital city, teaching public speaking to uh, law students and future politicians. That was a very big deal in their society. And although he had been raised in a Christian home, like a lot of college kids, he abandoned his Christian faith when he left home. And he soon developed a reputation for wild parties and chasing women. His mom also heard rumors that her son had gotten mixed up. Not only had he rejected Christianity, but he'd gotten mixed up in this weird Eastern cult. So she's really concerned about him and the lifestyle he was living. So she prayed for him regularly. She continually sought her pastor's help in praying for her wayward son. And, uh, I mean, she drove this poor pastor crazy, coming to him all the time, Pastor, please pray with me about my son and the lifestyle he's living and how, how far he's wandered away from the Lord. And finally, probably just to get her off his back, the uh, pastor told her, go home. Because, quote, it cannot be that the son of so many tears should be lost. Later, one of her son's close friends had a near-death experience. And that led Monica's son to reconsider the Christian faith he had been brought up in. A uh, near-death experience will tend to do that sometimes. And after studying the New Testament, he gave his heart to Christ, and he went on to become probably the most influential Christian theologian this side of the Apostle Paul. Today, some people even call him Saint Augustine. But it was a mother's prayers that played a role and bringing him back to the Lord. If you've raised a rebel, don't stop praying. 
Don't give up. Keep turning them over to the Lord. Godly parents also trust that God will provide. In verse 19, Then they arose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord and returned again to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah had relations with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. It came about in due time, after Hannah had conceived, that she gave birth to a son and named him Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. So after learning or leaving her burden with the Lord and receiving encouragement from Eli the priest, Hannah went home. Her new countenance demonstrated that she was trusting in God to answer her prayers. And in due time, God granted her request and she gave birth to a son. She gave him the name Samuel, which literally means God heard. Every time she called her son, Samuel, she was reminded God had heard her prayer. God was faithful. Now, if we're going to be honest, we have to admit, sometimes God does not give us what we want. Instead, he gives us what we need. God heard Hannah and gave her what she requested because it fit his plan to prep the ground for Israel to get a king. However, he could just as easily have called Hannah to keep trusting him for her provision without giving her a son. He could have said, Hannah, you need to find your fulfillment in me. Consider the experience of the Apostle Paul that he records for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul had something he called a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was. It was some kind of physical debilitating condition that interfered with his quality of life and his ability to minister. And Paul says on three separate occasions, he begged God, please, Lord, take this away. And every time the answer came back, no. And God finally expressed to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect or displayed in weakness. God gave Paul what he needed not what he wanted. And sometimes he does the same thing with us. Uh, several years ago, Garth Brooks had a, a song, Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. Some of y'all are a little too young to remember that one. Garth who? Brooks sings about running into an old high school flame. And this was the girl that at the time when he was in high school, he thought this was the one he wanted to spend the rest of his life with. But now, years later, uh, let's just say the bloom had come off the rose. And so he is sitting there saying, thank you, Lord, for not listening to me when I prayed that prayer. And the refrain goes, sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. Remember when you're talking to the man upstairs. Just because he doesn't answer doesn't mean he don't care. Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. God gives us what we need, not necessarily what we think we want. Seek God in prayer as you seek to raise your children. But trust, he's going to provide what we need, even if he doesn't give us what we want. Fourthly, godly parents keep their promises. In verse 21, Then the man Elkanah went up with all his household to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay for his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, I will not go up until the child is weaned. Then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord and stay there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Remain until you've weaned him. Only may the, may the Lord confirm his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with a three-year-old bull and one ephah of flour and a jug of wine and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, although the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull and brought the boy to Eli. And she said, Oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I'm the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. For this boy I prayed. And the Lord has given me my petition, which I asked of him. So I have also dedicated him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he's dedicated to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Hannah kept her word, even though it cost her. When Samuel had been weaned, which probably means he was about three or four years old, Hannah made good on her promise to turn him over to the priest to serve at the sanctuary. Now, think about that for a minute. Think about how hard she had prayed for this boy 
and now she's had him for three years and yet think about the faith it took to turn this son whom she had waited for for so long over to the care of strangers think about that and consider Hannah was entrusting her son into the care of Eli who didn't exactly have the best record when it came to raising his own boys. But Hannah made a vow to the Lord, and she intended to keep it. Now, our children need to see us as people of integrity. Our children need to observe us demonstrating honesty and integrity in everything we do, even and perhaps especially when it costs us to do so. Stuart Briscoe once wrote about uh, being hired to work in a bank when he was a young man. And at the time, he was young, he was new, he was just learning the business. And one day his boss said, if Mr. Smith calls, tell him I'm out. And so Briscoe said, well, are you planning to go somewhere? And the boss said, no, I just don't want to talk to him. So tell him I'm not here. And Briscoe said, well, let me make sure I understand you here. Are you asking me to lie for you? And the boss got furious. He was outraged. And Briscoe prayed real quick, you know, Lord, give me wisdom. And all of a sudden he said this inspired thought. And he said, hey, listen, boss, you should really be happy about this. I mean, if I won't lie for you, is it not safe to assume I won't lie to you? That's integrity. That's consistency. And our kids need to see us demonstrate that kind of honesty. And this kind of integrity is as much caught as it is taught. Our children need to know that our word is good. They need to know when we say, don't cross this line or there'll be consequences, there are going to be consequences. Trust me, I know how hard it is sometimes to hold that line. The tears are coming down. Yet. you got to hold the line. They also need to know that when we say, I love you, we mean it. We need to show them that we keep our word. And then finally, from Hannah's story, we see that godly parents remember where their true strength lies. In chapter 2, the opening verses there, we have this, Hannah is just has this, this song of praise that bubbles out of her. Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth speaks boldly against my enemies. Because I rejoice in your salvation. There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. Boast no more, so ever proudly. Do not let arrogance come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and with him actions are weighed. The, bo the bows of the mighty are shattered, and the feeble gird on strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for bread, and those who were hungry cease to hunger. Even the barren gives birth to seven, because she who, has, but she who has many children languishes. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and rich. He brings low. He also exalts. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he sets the world on them. He keeps the feet of his godly ones, but the wicked ones are silenced in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. Those who contend with the Lord shall be shattered. Against them he will thunder in the heavens. God will judge the ends of the earth, and he will give strength to his king, and will exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went to his home at Ramah, but the boy ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest. Hannah remembered that God is in control and every blessing ultimately comes from his hand every good thing in your life ultimately is a gift from God don't ever forget that being a parent is a rewarding job but it's one that can only be performed well with the Lord's help someone once remarked becoming a mother is not too difficult being a mother is very much so same thing can be said for a father. But through the Bible and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, God can help you be a good parent. 
Abraham Lincoln is reported to have said once, no man is poor who's had a godly mother. Our kids need godly mothers and godly fathers and godly grandparents and godly aunts and uncles and godparents and neighbors. They need godly adults in their lives to influence them and to train them and to show them what it means to love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might and to love your neighbor as yourself. A few years ago, I gave my wife a card which said, the greatest gift a father can give his children is to love their mother. That's important. But I submit to you that there's a gift that's even greater. The greatest gift a parent can give their child is to demonstrate a love for God that spills out into a godly character. So what kind of gift are you giving your children right now? And they can, can they see God's hand at work through you? Will you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you for being our father and for giving us an example of what a good father is. Some of us have been blessed with godly fathers and mothers. Some of us can't say that. Some of us carry the scars from bad relationships with our parents. But Lord, in you, we see a father who loves and disciplines and guides and protects and provides. Lord, thank you for that example. Help us as we raise these children you've entrusted into our hands to let your example show through us. To give them unconditional love and protection and provision and guidance. To train them to love you and to demonstrate before them a godly life. Thank you for the example of Hannah. Help us to pick up the torch and carry it forward. And I pray for all the parents in this room and the grandparents and all of those who have children in their circle of influence. Help us, Lord, to let you work through us to train them up to love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Where this all begins is with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's when we come to the point in our lives where we say, Lord, I believe you were who you claimed to be. I know I've been the prodigal. I've run away from my heavenly father, but I'm ready to come home. Come into my life, take control. Help me to live for you from this point forward. Maybe you're at that point in your life right now. You've been running from God. You've, you've been trying to forge your own path and you keep running into dead ends. But today you're ready to come home to your heavenly father, to come to the savior, Jesus who gave his life for your sake to make it possible for you to come home. We want to give you an opportunity to enter that relationship this morning. As we sing, I'm going to be standing here at the front. If God's drawing you today to take that step of faith, I encourage you to just step out and come down and tell me that. Pastor, I need to, I need to receive Christ. Can you tell me more? Maybe you've taken that step. You're ready to take the next step, which is to stand up and be counted, to say to the world, you have decided to follow Jesus. One of the first ways you express that publicly is through the act of baptism. Now, we won't baptize you today, but if you're ready to take that step, this is your opportunity to come and let us know. You're ready to, to get that machinery moving. Maybe you're a believer, you've been baptized, but you need a church family to be a part of. And you would like to know how to officially become part of the family here at New Salem. Yeah, this is your opportunity to take that step. However God's leading you today, maybe it's just to come to the altar and ask for his help as you seek to be a godly parent. This is the part of the service where we respond back to God. So I encourage you as we sing, let this be your prayer. And if God's drawing you, you step out in faith and you come.
speak what is true, speak what is true, speak what is true. Thank you for being here today. I always forget to say this to those of you who are joining us online. If God's leading you in any of those ways and you want somebody to come alongside you as you take that next step, you can go to our website at newsalembaptist.net slash decision and you'll find a form there that you can use to reach out to us uh, to let us know about the step you're ready to take and we'll be in touch to talk with you more about it. Um, real quick before we dismiss today, uh, first of all, next Sunday we got a very special guest going to be with us, Jackson Bowman from the Hamilton County Baptist Association, a rising new leader. I encourage you to come and you're going to enjoy Brother Jackson as he uh, comes to share with us next week. May 23rd, we're going to recognize graduates. And so I hope you'll be here for that. And uh, come celebrate our, our graduate that we know of this year that's graduating. If you have any graduate family we don't know about and they want to take part, let us know quick so we can make sure we include them. Um, we have a new sermon series that's coming really soon. As we go through this process of getting back up to speed, we're going to be learning lessons from the books of Ezra and Nehemiah as we learn to rebuild the house of God. And that's going to be our focus for this summer heading into the fall. So that's coming up very, very soon. We'll be kicking that off here in just a few weeks. God bless you. Go enjoy your Mother's Day. We'll see you next time.